The future is unknown, not just for you, but for society. When we look at how technology unfolds, we can be pretty accurate about tomorrow or next week. And as the writer William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So based on small patches of current innovation, we might be able to accurately guess at aspects of the next five or 10 or even 20 years. But beyond that, as we get further and further from today, the more the possibilities begin to multiply. Our simple projection diverges to become a tree of possibility. A possibility. Uh, mm, no, sorry. The best way we can see long-term forecasting at work is to cheat. Let's wind the clock back to last century. Lots of smart people made well thought out predictions of where we'd be beyond 2000. Flying cars and jetpacks for all. Autonomous humanoid robots. Cities on the moon. And lots and lots of free time. They were dead wrong. At the same time, other smart people made even crazier technology predictions, which don't seem quite so crazy now. Small, orbiting, rocket-propelled space stations that would be the basis of a worldwide communications network. People wouldn't just need a computer, they would hold them in their hands. And the people with the computers would use the communications network to share information. And so with a little hindsight, we can see that foresight is not an easy business. Futurist Jim Data said, any useful idea about the future should appear to be ridiculous. It doesn't mean that the future is a laugh a minute. He's actually saying that unless your idea is so challenging and out there, compared to the way things are today, it simply isn't futuristic enough. So let's test this out and imagine a ridiculous, but actually possible future proposed by computer scientist John Storrs Hall. It's a chair. It's a car. It's a prehensile monkey tail. New from Drextech. It's Utility Fog, powered by a swarm of tiny remote control robots. Create, levitate, manipulate, teleport, and shapeshift. Just like magic, only it's 100% nanotechnology. Utility Fog has no self-replicating, human-harming, or world-eating capabilities. As a rule, we're not very good at thinking about the impacts of new technologies. We imagine a technology will nicely and neatly solve problem A, but conveniently forget it may worsen situation B, produce new opportunity C, and create an entirely new problem D. So rather than just think about a future with utility fog as a big indigestible lump, let's instead look at it through a series of filters and in so doing, hopefully see new opportunities and new impacts we might otherwise have missed. If there is tech this sophisticated, there's a pretty good chance it would mean no limits on resources or supply, which could remove industries like agriculture, mining, processing and traditional manufacturing. This would dramatically affect employment, education, retailing and services. Nanocomputing will also further increase options for communication and surveillance, impacting relationships, safety and security. Utility fog could well offer cleaner technologies and reduced waste. It could rehabilitate huge areas of the environment previously turned over to industry. But would you then value the wonders of nature if utility fog could do just as well, if not better. And what becomes of artists or craftspeople when we can all make such things? But just because you can make unicorns may not mean everyone can. What if utility fog is a little expensive and it divides the world into rich nanotech wizards and poor ordinary tech muggles? And does that imply that all the people rich or poor are then at the mercy of the owners and programmers of Utility Fog. But let's not forget you, the individual. Would Utility Fog change who you are and what you do? What if it could change your clothes? 
improve your health, reshape your body, or your face? And what if nanocomputing could allow all the possibilities of utility fog to be controlled with just a thought? Would it change how you think and what you believe? Would you think that you were playing God? Would it affect your self-image? Would you even know who you were and what was real? Well, utility fog is just one person's idea of what might be possible. But the future is not laid out in front of us. It's created as we go, by you, me and them. Do you want that future? If you think through the possibilities of a new technology, you can better appreciate the consequences of using it. I'm Christine Peterson. I'm co-founder of Foresight Institute, a nonprofit focused on nanotechnology, and also chairman of the Personalized Life Extension Conference Series and HealthActivator.com, which focus on, focuses on extending the human health span, particularly individuals' health span. Nanotechnology is currently in an incremental stage. Um, Advances are being made every day. They tend to be on the small side, uh, not too surprising for nanotechnology, but uh, within the next 10 years, uh, one of the most exciting advances, I believe, is going to be in the medical space, particularly in the area of cancer, in terms of detection, imaging, and treatment of cancer. All those areas are going to benefit tremendously from nanotechnology. Um, we're starting to see early clinical trials now, so I'm hoping some of these uh, technologies will be coming online for patients to actually use within the next 10 years. Yes, that's one of the technologies, and I, I particularly like that one because I think it's a very elegant uh, mechanism. Uh, but there are many other nanoparticle-based technologies for treating cancer that are, that are being explored. We don't really know who's going to win at this point. Uh, but they're pretty exciting, uh, and we really, those of us who've seen traditional chemotherapy uh, among members of our family know how horrendous it is, and so we're all really rooting for one of these to work out. So the question here is what comes next, 20 to 30 years out? Um, the it's interesting because nanotechnology is such a fundamental, ubiquitous type of thing. It's basically um, starts with better materials. Uh, and of course, any physical object we make is made of materials. So better materials will propagate ac across all of our product areas. Uh, and then after better materials comes better devices at the nanoscale. And then finally, better systems, physical systems that move, um, actuators, of detectors, sensors, all those things. So what we're seeing is a change from basically um, dumb objects to smart objects. So we pick up this one and we say, all right, right now this is a dumb object. It has no computational power. Um, it has no ability to try to figure out whether I want the liquid inside to be hot or cold, for example. Um, in the future, all of our products will eventually be smart products and they will have computational abilities and other, other types of abilities. For example, shape changing. You know, this is a nice size, but um, oftentimes it won't fit in the cup holder in the car. Um, I would like it to be smaller. Well, there should be a button on the side. You just touch it, boom, it it's, it's reconfigures. So this is the type of smart technology that we will eventually have across the board in terms of our consumer products, I believe. The way I think about it is that right now we build things out of materials that don't change. 
um, pretty much. We hope they don't change. That's our goal. Um, I think in the future, it will be the opposite, where we'll be using materials that are designed to change, to change shape, to change color, to have uh, video displays on their surfaces, to make noises, to do computation, and on and on and on. So um, it's, a, it's, a way, uh, it's a way to think about getting away from the dumbness of objects into the smartness of objects. And it's almost hard for us to imagine because um, we've lived forever with dumb objects. The idea that everything around us could be malleable, could be computing, could be sensing what we want, guessing, guessing what we want based on what we say. For example, I could say, you know, that, that, that's really a boring color on that wall. It really would look much better red. Boom, it's red. It's like magic, right? And of course, the classic saying, um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, once you understand the technology, it is distinguishable from magic. You understand it. To us right now, to many people, currently, it would feel like magic. Just say it and it turns color. It's like magic. I find the utility fog concept fascinating. Um, I'm not sure that I'm the one to do the technical analysis of it, uh, but I do know Josh Hall's a very smart guy, and I would not bet against him. Um, I think that um, something like that, where uh, basically you're dealing with very small things, which are very smart, um, and can cooperate with each other, either to, either to come together to build a physical structure or to form a display, um, I think these things will come. Setting a particular date is hard to do. We all know that. Um, but eventually, yeah, I think s things like that um, will be coming. Um, predicting the exact technical characteristics of them is not my area. But again, I, I am not one to bet against Josh Hall. I don't think the general public has any concept uh, worth mentioning about what is nanotechnology. Uh, at the very most, they might have noticed on their blue jeans in the store, it says something about nanotechs or, or, or some kind of nano coating on, and, and, and maybe it, it means that this, this piece of clothing is, is stain resistant. That's pretty much the extent, I would think, of the average person's knowledge of nanotechnology. I'd say it's pretty much non-existent, I would say. I think that in the near term, um, what people are calling nanotechnology involves these very simple particles that are down uh, at the nano scale, maybe a hundred nanometers or so. Um, and it is the case that there may be concerns. There may be technical concerns, um, there may be environmental concerns, health concerns in, in, for some of these particles. Um, these are not smart devices that can go into the body and do and, and know to, only to do good things. These are dumb, dumb particles and they're in a size range that we're not necessarily very good at, at dealing with. For example, smoke particles are in that space and those are not healthy for us. So I think um, today's crude nanoparticle technology, um, definitely I would agree there can be issues and they need to be examined. Um, it's only when you look in the longer term, when you look at, at, at uh, materials, devices, systems that can be deliberately designed by us to be, to be clean, to be green, to be healthy, to promote human health, uh, or to clean up the environment. That's, that's the scenario that excites me. That's a longer term thing. What's happening today is, is not that. It, uh, and I think we do need to look at the health and environmental issues raised by some of these early nanoparticle technologies. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference between what gets called nanotechnology today, which are these dumb nanoparticles, very simple chunks of, of stuff 
that just happen to be a little smaller than the chunks of stuff that we've used before. Uh, and the longer term nanotechnology, which really is about precision control uh, of machinery down at the nanoscale or even the uh, molecular or atomic scale. So that's all about control. What we have today that gets labeled nanotechnology is not about control. It's, it's relatively uncontrolled technology um, involving materials and sizes we're not familiar with. So uh, it's almost the opposite in terms of, of how much we know about uh, how much control we have at, down at that scale. Today, we don't have good control. In the future, I believe we will have excellent control, but that's probably decades off. There have been debates uh, on the question of can we really have the type of control, the type of mach mechanical machine style control down at the nanoscale that we can have at the macro scale. These are highly technical debates uh, and uh, in order to really participate you have to be uh, pretty scientific yourself. Um, my impression is that eventually uh, we will learn to do what we want to do uh, down at that scale. I don't think that we are necessarily restricted always to biological models. I think um, uh, my impression is that there aren't physical laws that uh, prohibit doing mechanical style uh, operations down at the nanoscale. To the extent there are such physical laws, we will not be able to do it. Uh, but the purpose of engineering is to find out how do we do what we want using uh, whatever physical laws there are. And I believe that we will find a way to do what we want to do at that scale. My impression is that we won't be limited always to biological methods. Biological methods are wonderful, they're very powerful, and we can do them today, which is great. But will we be limited that way decades from now, 50 years from now? I wouldn't necessarily bet that. Certainly in the long term, when you're looking at any powerful technology, you always have to ask, how can this be abused? Because people do that. Um, any kind of technology, and we've seen this again and again, whether it's um, the invention of the canning of food or the invention of the trains, these things are always used for military purposes. That's just how it goes. So we know for sure that nanotechnologies uh, at, all, at all time frames will be used for military purposes. And so the question then becomes, who's controlling these, these um, who's making the decisions about how to deploy these, these uh, military nanotechnologies, which can either be defensive or could potentially be offensive? And who makes those decisions? Um, who's de who is making the developments? Who's developing these things? And who's deploying them? Um, and for what purpose? Um, th of course, these, these are not new concerns. We have these concerns always about any, any technology and any military technology that can either be uh, offensive or defensive. So it's not a new concern, uh, but it's a very real concern. And um, we certainly have to look at that with nanotechnology. It makes a difference who's ahead in nanotechnology. I think to try to picture a world where nanotechnology is deployed responsibly, um, you have to say, well, let's look at other technologies, today's technologies or, or very near-term technologies. Who is deploying those responsibly? Which societies around the world are doing the best job um, at properly deploying technology? And sort of, and say, all right. Whoever's doing it well today, probably it's, it's their political system that is, is helping them do it right. Uh, and if someone's doing it wrong, it's probably their political system again that's, that is undermining their ability to be responsible. So then once you can pick a political system or a set of countries that you feel, all right, you know, they're not perfect, but they're the best we've got. Then what you want to do is say, well, how can we, this is, there's a race, there's a nanotechnology race. How can we give the, the, uh, the benefits of our efforts to these more responsible countries? Uh, 
A lot of what we hear about uh, speculations regarding longer term uses of nanotechnology systems, if you look at what's actually being discussed, there's a lot of software that's got to be involved in these systems. Uh, so uh, the power of nanotechnology in the long term is very dependent on some kind of convergence between the physical technology of nanotechnology and the software technology of whether it's our art expert systems or artificial intelligence, uh, some kind of very sophisticated software is going to be needed to do some of the advanced applications. For example, sending nanoscale devices into the body to carry out complex operations such as DNA repair, for example. That's going to take some pretty cool software. Um, either inside the body or outside, but wherever it is, it's, there's going to be some heavy-duty computation going on to do that. So that's, uh, that's true for almost any really advanced uh, nanotechnology or, in fact, other technologies. You, software is involved increasingly, and we see that even now uh, to do really interesting things. There's generally a software component. So, um, and that makes it harder. Of course, software is hard, uh, nanotechnology is hard, neither of these are easy, uh, and, and bringing them together is going to be even harder. So um, you need people who are very broad in their skill sets, right, to make that convergence happen. You need to have someone who understands the physical side, the nano side, plus the software side. So these are very special people, uh, and they're going to be very valuable in the future. What excites me for the long term and what makes me work hard on uh, promoting the, res the responsible development and use of nanotechnology is both the, the uh, application in health and medicine, certainly, uh, but deep down what has always uh, really driven me has been the knowledge that if we do a good job of developing nanotechnology properly, we can use it heal the earth. We can, we can repair all the damage we've done to the earth. We can make it a, a green, beautiful place again. We can make it so that all uh, the species that are decimated in the oceans can repopulate. Uh, we can feed human beings with uh, whatever they want to eat. It seems that's, uh, that's meat or fish without having to kill animals to do it. We can clean up all of the toxic waste. Um, we can, we can, in the long term, we can totally heal the earth. And uh, that is, that's a, a very inspiring vision for me and I think for many people who are excited about nanotechnology. Um, the idea that what we see today doesn't have to be this way and we can fix it. I think in the near term, uh, I'm concerned about the political situation. I think currently the world is not headed in a healthy direction politically, um, including in the U.S. Uh, we're not seeing an increase in human freedom, even in our own country. Uh, so we're not necessarily seeing the responsible use of um, military technology overseas, even by the U.S. So it's, it's a scary time. Um, it's a scary time economically. Um, I think, you know, the U.S. is a relatively wealthy country, but when the economy is doing badly, or if we have a major pullback on the economy, which I think is quite possible, um, many things go wrong. They, uh, the environment gets trashed because people feel poor. They don't feel wealthy enough to take care of the environment. Um, uh, this, the disadvantaged don't get cared for. Um, often there's more aggression overseas to kind of distract the population from the, di from the economic problems. Uh, it's, it, many things go wrong. So, and that's sort of where we're headed right now. So I, I am disturbed by the current political situation. Uh, I'm hoping that we, we pull out of it. And 10 years from now, things may look very good again.